Hello everyone, my name is Cerise, Cerise Steve, and I'll be your MC today. Thank you, welcome everyone. So we are going to start by welcoming Mr. Jean-François Casavacazan to our event today, the director of the French Participant Council. Welcome, I guess. Welcome. 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 The Dean is Sarah Lee Bochon, Director General of the National Resident Administration. The Dean is Shu Wei Wu, Director General of the Food and Drug Administration. The Dean is Lee Shatan, Director of Consumer Goods and uh, uh, the Chemical Industries Division at the Industrial Development Bureau. The Dean is the guest. I'm very happy to have the great opportunity today to elaborate the forum, which aims at reinforcing the cooperation between Taiwan and France of health in the health sector. And so Taiwan benefits from a long tradition of scientific cooperation. Indeed, cooperation between hospitals has been going for a long and been good on for quite a long time. And French pharmaceutical and medical equipment companies have been in Taiwan for years. They have built, built a strong relationship with local players in both private and public sectors. Digital healthcare offers new perspective of cooperation to French and Taiwanese players. It is a top priority of Taiwan and of France health sector transformation agenda. In 2019, the French government has accelerated its EU policy with the creation of the National Digital Health Agency, which oversees the framework for rolling out digital solutions and e health platforms to help companies engage the regulatory framework and ensure their quick entry to the market. At the same time, the digital transformation is very high on the Taiwanese government agenda and list of priorities. In fact, since 2017, the executive yuan has been accelerating the development of a digital infrastructure where internet access is deemed a human right, regulations on women care and inclusion are reasons and several developments of telemedicine established across the island. More recently, in September 2020, French healthcare company Sanofi and Taiwanese health diabetes management company Health to Sank signed a partnership to apply digital solutions in 300 clinics and hospitals nationwide. Over the next three years, these two companies are leading the way to strengthen cooperation between France and Taiwan in digital health. Today, this forum is therefore a great opportunity to explore areas of potential collaboration between France and Taiwan. It will not only serve to kickstart the conversation on the future of these digital health regulations and reimbursement in Taiwan, but also create a space for French and Taiwanese companies to learn more about each other and foster relationships. This is also the organizers ambitions and the organizers and the French say in my heart because you are with the incredible talk here in Taiwan. And the organizers ambition to have this uh, even play the groundwork for a series of exchanges between France and Taiwan with a white paper on the digital health sector summarizing key actions discussed during the forum. I am convinced that this forum 
will help to improve health outcome and potential saving on the long term, facilitate access to healthcare treatments, and staff through remote uh, and staff through remote monitoring cost detection, even in the case of a pandemic, and sustain the development of a fast growing sector, providing revenues and employment for Taiwanese and French speaking workforce. To conclude, I would like to thank the Ministry of Health and Welfare, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, French Tech Taiwan, and Sanofi for their support in organizing this great event. I wish you this session a great success. Thank you very much, Mr. Diaz. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome Mrs. Li Chang-Fong, the uh, Director of Consumer Goods and Chemical Industries Division of the Industrial Development Bureau, Ministry of Economic Affairs. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is our pleasure to work with the French office in Taipei and the law French type Taiwan to host today's forum. Taiwan is one of the best places for digital health development. We have comprehensive databases such as the National Health Insurance Database and uh, many power patterns in the biomedical, healthcare, and IT sector. The Industrial Development Bureau, under the Ministry of Economic Affairs, Taiwan has promoted the development of IT and the biomedical sector for years. In order to encourage collaboration between ICT and the biomedical players, we are also actively pushing the new aid for the development of the biotech and the new pharmaceutical industry amendment to support digital medicine and the digital medical products development in Taiwan. Today's forum is an excellent opportunity for Taiwan and the French to exchange information on digital health development trends. Its regulatory framework, uh, bilateral industrial collaboration opportunity, and uh, to create a friendly business development environment for digital health startups and their enterprises. I wish today's event a great success and uh, all participants have wonderful results. Thank you. Now we'd like to welcome Dr. Hudong. Director General of National Health Insurance Administration. Uh, Mr. Lenny and uh, Mr. Tom. Tom. I'm going to ask for my name. Yeah. Very quick pronouns. This is the case. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Ho Chang Li. I'm working in the NGI. Today I'm happy to come here on behalf of our Minister of Health and Welfare. To say something for you. Yeah. Actually, you know, in Taiwan, yeah, yeah, we for past uh, year, we also meet in the, I mean, with the COVID 19, yeah, and I can show you something. Yeah. And uh, I think recently, we know digital health is very, very important. And today, I also saw uh, many good speakers, like uh, uh, Professor uh, Chen, he wants to talk something about patient outcome and uh, our. Uh, Director General Wu Xiaomei, she will talking about some regulation program in Taiwan. Yeah. And also many, many speakers from the French, yeah. You also mentioned about the regulation. And I think it is very important for us. Yeah. And today we are very happy that the Bureau, uh, Bureau 
practice the Taipei, yeah, and then to organize this meeting, yeah. And you know, uh, last year we when we meet the uh, such kind of the such kind of community, yeah. And then you do know in Taiwan. So far, Taiwan is the most safest uh, country in the world. Yeah. And uh, we all go publish one paper in the brief space of Germany, yeah, talking about how we can learn from Taiwan response to uh, to the to COVID-19 and pandemic. And uh, I think this is very important. And so just now you also mentioned about in Taiwan, we have a big data. Uh, this is uh, for the past 25 years, the NHIA already collect many, many patient information, and many, uh, I think uh, we also uh, some claim data in Taiwan. So big data is very important. And uh, we also use this data to talk about how we can apply in the big world. Yeah. And today, Mr. Deng, yeah, he wants to talk about the uh, record diabetes management. He is also trying to collaborate with our HIA. And uh, I think later, when even uh, some speaker, we are talking about uh, this kind of regulation. Yeah. And in Taiwan, we also want uh, the GDPR to pay attention to privacy and security for all this kind of information. And I think one thing is very important uh, why Taiwan can often have a very good uh, uh, I mean, the uh, healthcare to, uh, to meet the COVID 19. I think uh, in the beginning we used the APSR. Now we have a very successful network. Yeah. So even uh, in Taiwan, it, for all the uh, hospitals in Taiwan and uh, some uh, pharmacy, pharmaceutical uh, drugstore in Taiwan, they have the network with our HIA. So this time, when we try to offer some information to all of the, I mean, the medical providers in Taiwan, is very successful and very efficient. Yeah. So this is uh, the most important thing in Taiwan. Yeah. So you can see, I think one thing is very important. Uh, my colleague uh, yeah, is trying to, I mean, to, to build up the we call the, the, the TOCC. We try to let all the people in Taiwan when they come back from from abroad, they can so they can they come back from different country, and all the medical providers will know this patient. This patient they come to the clinic, we know is it possible to have the COVID-19. Yeah. So in that way, we should try to, I mean, to avoid the spread of the COVID-19. So this kind of uh, uh, structure is just the base for the digital health system. Yeah. So in the beginning, yeah, and we don't have such, such successful network here. Yeah. So in that time, it's very, very difficult to offer this information to all the medical providers. I think this is very important. And you know, Taiwan, in the beginning, we, are, we don't have so many masks, but now all of us, we can have the mask. But in, during the time, how can we, I mean, share the mask very evenly, for, I mean, very fair for all the people in Taiwan. So we also use our national health insurance card. I mean, to let all the people, how, can, how much they can buy in, in, within two weeks, yeah, from the drug store. I think this is very important for us. Yeah. And then now, we also try to offer some more information to all the providers. I think this is just based on the, the network that we call the VPN to all the providers. I think this is very important. But uh, I think uh, so far uh, in Taiwan, we are just a single care system. So our national health insurance system is quite different from our country. In our country, they may have many, many commercial insurance. Yeah. So I mean, the structure is quite different. And in the future, we also wish you all our HIV data can share the, for, for all the, 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 I mean, all the technical institutions. Yeah. But we know today, there are also many people that come from the industrial company. Yeah. And in Taiwan, we try to promote uh, that kind of, I mean, the, the promotion of some we, we call the industry. Yeah. So I think it is uh, today, I wish all the, I mean, the, the Many speakers they can offer many good information to all of the digital audience. Yeah. I think this is very important for us. Yeah. And recently, we also published one book yeah, talking about the, what we have done in Taiwan and I think I think this book is very. I mean, we have received very, very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, I wish today our uh, meeting is very successful. And now we will move on to our keynote session. I would like to invite our first keynote speaker, Dr. Ray Jen Chen, Chair Professor of Taipei Medical University and former Superintendent of Taipei Medical University Hospital. Uh, 
First, I'd like to welcome everyone. Yeah, first, I'd like to thank the organization and the invitation of uh, Lafa Tech. I won. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, everybody is uh, crazy about the teach tutorials, but uh, how about the outcome? I think that, and also during the COVID 19, I think the actual the health skill system is a dramatic change. So, therefore, I think I will focus on this the teach tutorials and the vision outcome and build. And I have a top bit about myself. I'm a trauma and a couple of years negative surgery, but I spent a long time in administration and also spent about two years in bed waiting for minutes. So as a surgeon, administrator, and also the economics. So I combined this all, I hope it offers some information to all the participants. Next. Next. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. So my talk of today is actually focused on three sections. First, the digital health. But digital health, everybody talking about the digital transformation. Why is the evolution? Because it's crazy. Because the healthcare system is very strong and very traditional. But for facing the digital transformation, actually we have a basic we have resistance. So actually the, 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 the evolution is not so strong. And after COVID-19, I think there's a lot of change. And also the, the patient outcome, I think I will use the Taipei Medical University as an example. So yeah. Let's uh, trace back to the 20 and 2000 years. I got time in Taiwan and in all over the hospital in the world, we are like focusing on the so-called the, the two earliest human, the medical qualities. So we spend a lot of manpower, time to try to correct our pathway, to correct our, you know, to reduce our mortality in hospitals. But however, in the in the next years, we found the problem is a system failure. So we have come out this one, closing the quality kaizen, especially as me, I'm a trauma surgeon. So the system. The hospital system and the pre-hospital system actually is a conflict. So the EMS guy send the patient to the hospital, the hospital say, oh no. But even inside the hospital, the different department actually, a lot of the Kaiser, a lot of the gate between the, the, the hospitals. But during the 2000 and 2010, everybody use a lot of manpower um, to try to you know, fix the gate. But actually, it's no worse. Until 2010, this is come from the Institute of Medicine from the States. They are focusing on providing a lot of uh, recommendation for the older the medical societies. And then they come out with building a service system and then for better care using the IC. So from that time, I see more and more people. But however, at that time, the healthcare system actually is two separate One is top down, one is bottom down. The top down is traditional. That is focusing on the disease and focusing on the institution century. But now, in the last 20, last 20 years, everybody, especially the consumer, the patient and the family, they want to wellness the health. So, and I also try to use a lot of the digital device. So, from the 2011 until now, I think every country, even in the France, in the States, in Taiwan, we have put a lot of effort in this field. But, despite of this, the evolution, I think that more and more, your skills is focusing on the so called precision of medicine. Personalized, proactive, and then the hospital will become more and more decentralized, especially with the COVID 19. Nobody wants to go to the hospitals. And then the, you know, the doctors say anything that becomes a factor to, to listen to the patients. More and more, it has become the value 
You know, on the national health insurance in Taiwan, we have to do a lot of quality improvements, but we still under the volume basis. We are not under the outcome basis. So, you scale back to the bottom line. It's a very complex. We spend a lot of years in the medical school, and to be the internship, and then the residentship, and become a specialist. And then this major is uh, comprehensive and also very expensive, especially with the new product, new instruments, and new procedure. However, the digital you know, technology we are slow to increase, but right now we, we understand, we have to do it. And then, using the big data analytical, I will show you just like the Director General of uh, Professor Lee, talking about the NHR in here. So the next one is the next, the COVID-19. I think everybody right now is asking this question, when will it be the end? And then, we are talking about the normalcy. Current immunity, Taiwan, right now we are facing this problem too. And it will be ended in the, this Christmas. But the most important thing is this focus. Nobody is safe. And here, everybody is safe. So therefore, her community and a lot of the, you know, public health care system, they're the only way to take care of the health care system. So this is uh, in the drama published in the last May, and here this year. You can consider a lot of the rending and the standardization even between the country will become more you know, standards. And then protecting the workforce and then more and more virtual telemedicine. Yeah, Taiwan we also started to apply in the, the virtual care. And then prepare this for the next slide, maybe COVID-21. COVID-22, yeah, maybe. And then the, to solve the quality. So the only way is that the uneven, even all the recoveries are even, but only the digital, I think, is always right. So I think that for the digital health, and that's why we are getting together in here. I think this is the, we are very, very positive of facing the pandemic. So, but what's the next? I think that the next of the health scale will be the way and the way of anywhere, anytime. But the most important is connecting. The connectivity is connected and empowering the patient. Sorry. And not only one person, and only one family is for the whole population. And not only managing for the disease and the focusing on the health and awareness. So the facial facial outcome, I think the Tai uh, Taipei Medical University is uh, right next to the Taipei 101. If you have never been to there, but uh, it's a uh, middle size general. But however, we a large patient volume, so we have to teach price to do this kind of service. But we also receive a lot of accreditation, even the national and international accreditation. So therefore, we are facing a lot of standard check. So, and then the hospital. If we go to the hospital, you have to go in. You have to be a good outcome. But the, during a good outcome, everybody expects a good experience. And then also for the administrator and for the hospital side, they talk in the cost of saving. The only way I hear is time. So this is uh, just like uh, the, the director general mentioned about uh, the TOCC. The TOCC actually two years we are put in the car is in the clinics, but the patients are already entry into the hospital. So it is possible to block the patient before he enter into the hospital. So that's why and we have used this the so-called the kiosk. And to try to one to two seconds to identify his DOCC. And then we try to keep most patients in the hospital in safe. And then uh, the OPD is again we post uh, the Tiger Medical University Hospital. Every day we have about 5,000 outpatients in a small place. So therefore we need a very highly efficient 
So we are trying to use the uh, before the hospital and then come to the hospital. Everything put in the crowd. Of course, it's a private crowd. And then go to the informed consent and papers. And then the laboratory automation and everything is automation. And then record everything. And then this is the impatience. The patient come in and then we will. We are done who is the immediate and then this is a white board in the nursing station and all the patients, the all the data that the iPad and they can recognize all the patients chart. And then the team have as far you know to see the patient safe. Now the when the patient transfer to other place for the you know examination or CT scan or to the operation room in the team and the team always went forward and then come in. And the most important thing is the ADC. The drug cabinet in each worker to you know to try to keep everything safe. And then this even the you know, hospitals, the station, you can see we can because of this violation and temperature. So the next station is already absent. Previous is like this, right now it's like this. And then the nurse working inside and then can keep. So that is good for the community. So I think the keyword is everybody wanted the AI, but I think the working started the, the basic. The basic is the reducing the open loading, reducing error, and uh, providing the virtual assistance. But not just aim for the accuracy of the analysis only. So the data, you know, the AI we need the data. The, the we have the camera you know, data from the data HIV, and then we got the hospital. Bring the data. And then we are trying to put all the data structurized and we put the, all the hospitals and then come in the reduced time. And then we are putting this all the data to in the, the ICU. Because the ICU is a lot of data, we are trying to do the automation. Our monitors and all the data come in and then get into the dashboard. And then the dashboard use the sofa and then we come out with the quality. And also, we can use the AI, of course, because every one minute we correct the matter sign. And then we use it now about 160 features, and then to do the early diagnosis of sepsis and early treatment. So, right now, we are like going to the TFDAs. And, yeah, the, and also, we can see the, the result is quite different. But the previous uh, so far is uh, 0 0.56 in ABC. Under this one, right now we're using this and we can up to the, this one. And then the, I think the most important thing is not only damage, even the healthcare provider when you're working in the hospital, I think all the data, not only in the hospital, but the, we have staff from the hospital and the collaborator with uh, you know the expert in here, a lot of the you know, sugar, other sign and the blood pressure. And then connect it to the little 5G and then it's a patient and that's it. Wait, I think that digital health is a reader, is picture out of the COVID 19. He will become a decentralized system. And then uh, the cosmos, the severe patient go to the hospital the last year, and the radio or go to the, the, the home or even the clinic only. And then very sure helps the adoption and the companies and the recycling. The most important is the subset of the healthcare system. But I think the virtual health and the digital health actually can sustain the whole healthcare system. So that's my talk, and I thank you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. After the clinical perspective, we're going to welcome Mr. Hadlas Abi. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I will be talking about um, what basically be a medium that dive into regulatory frameworks in um, developing Germany, the US, and Japan. 
The reason I chose these markets uh, for the reason being um, that these are the top largest healthcare markets in the world, and um, they, they've had already uh, a large dominance in that tech. And um, I want to talk to you about the regulatory frameworks they put in place to keep their dominance as we move more into the digital space. Uh, first, I want to uh, start just with a very short historic as to how we got here. Um, you know, looking back 50 years ago, it's really the upcoming of personal computers, the creation of uh, IT health departments, and with that, patient record systems. But uh, as early as the two uh, first decades of the 21st century, uh, we've got, you know, democratization of internet, and of course, smartphones and the creation of applications with the birth of regulatory frameworks to ensure that these applications are safe and effective. And uh, so in 2020, which I always joke uh, about the fact that this is a year that really does not need introducing. Of course, it's a pandemic uh, with a high adapt adaptability of digital health. And um, with that, uh, you have a layer of internet of medical things and an emphasis on big data and data analysis. Um, I like to always start with some definitions and terminology. If you have been interested in digital health, I'm sure you have been, uh, like me, perhaps I'm the only one, uh, but overwhelmed with, with the amount of, of terms um, that are out there. And I wanted to first just focus on three terms today. Basically, the difference between digitization and digitalization, as well as defining software as medical device. Um, basically, digitization is really moving from an analog system onto a digital uh, platform. But digitalization is different in a sense that you use technology and services to achieve um, an improvement in the healthcare outcome. So basically, you use you know modeling techniques and uh, algorithm, uh, algorithms to um, generate uh, insights that is of medical value. And that is often done through SAMP, which is um, you know, the acronym for Software as Medical Device. So what exactly is SAMD? According to the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, which is a, uh, an organization made of major regulators from the US, Japan, uh, Canada, Europe, um, etc. Software as medical device is a software that is intended to be used for one or more medical purposes that performs these purposes without being part of a hardware medical device. And this is um, the topic of today's discussion. How do we regulate software that is not part of a hardware but that is providing medical value um, just to its digital function? Um, yeah, so of course, uh, digital health has been carrying a lot of hope. Um, first, from its um, the way it performed during during the uh, pandemic, but also just the idea that we could create better um, healthcare outcomes for people and really reach a larger community and make healthcare uh, more accessible and more equitable. This is the opinion of the more enthusiastic people about digital health which um, I, I'm part of, but we also have to listen to the skeptics. The, the technology skeptics uh, do point to some hurdles that digital health uh, might be facing before we reach a scalability or a scale that can really make a difference. And um, there is consensus between both groups, the enthusiasts and the skeptics, that uh, really the four major hurdles for digital health to achieve scale are uh, primarily regulatory or a lack of supportive and agile systems uh, thereof, as well as uh, reimbursement uh, with a, a really uh, a change in the paradigm or uh, the way we assess solutions, digital solutions for, for uh, uh, reimbursement, then interoperability. We still globally are lacking a harmonized set of standards for different devices to talk to each other, and then uh, cybersecurity with the upcoming of Internet of, of Things and Internet of Medical Things. The more things you connect to each other, the more vulnerabilities you create in your system. 
So how do we move from hype to hope? You know, um, there has been a lot of hype around VR and there has been also a lot of hype around genomics and we'd like to ensure in the case of digital health that um, it actually delivers on its promises. I will talk to you first just about current limitations of the current regulatory systems. Um, most uh, software and medical devices will be developed by software companies that are still new to medical device regulations. That's um, uh, quite a hurdle still. Another topic is really the ongoing or frequent updates with potential impact to safety and effectiveness. So the way the current system works is that you have a hardware medical device that you know uh, you take through uh, a process of approval and assessment, say by an, uh, a local regulatory agency, say like the Taiwan FDA or the US FDA, and um, you then have that device on the market for a few years before you introduce a new design change. And that design change, if it impacts safety and effectiveness, has to be again reassessed by the local uh, competent authority. This, part, this type of process completely falls apart for software because the speed at which new versions are being released to the market is much higher than the speed the regulator is assessing uh, the, the devices. So it creates a bit of a backlog in the pipeline. Uh, another um, regulatory uh, concern is uh, for you know hardware medical devices, uh, when there is an issue, um, there is uh, ways of, or, or there is an expectation, say, of the manufacturer that they have in place SOPs to contain and identify and trace these devices, which is a bit difficult to put in place for software. And last but not least, from an effectiveness standpoint, um, generally when a hardware medical device is put through the approval process, we also submit you know, uh, information on its clinical effectiveness. Uh, most of the software and medical devices now entail some level of AI and ML, so artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning that learns really to being put on the market. So uh, we enter then a bit of a, a catch-22 situation where in order to put your software or your medical device on the market, you have to prove effectiveness. But then in order to prove effectiveness, you have to uh, have your software being used by a, a, a sizable number of users before you can show that. Um, its effectiveness. So how do we um, address these current limitations from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, so I want to talk to you about how Germany is, is handy in it. Uh, Germany, in my view, took a very, very bold um, uh, move. In uh, late 2019, precisely December 2019, they released a platform that's called DIGA. DIGA basically stands for Digital Health Applications. And in this platform, they allow uh, certain um, software and medical device manufacturers to obtain a preliminary approval and admission onto the, the, the DIGA directory so that they get commercialized uh, after three months, uh, put on the market, they can be prescribed by doctors, and um, they can also obtain full reimbursement by the national health insurance at the price the manufacturer has set. So in my view, this is really quite bold. And to, to go through the first, um, you know, to be on the preliminary admission list, you don't need to show effectiveness. Um, the manufacturer only needs to show some um, uh, levels of security of, of the device, uh, patient safety, as well as data privacy um, uh, and interoperability requirements. And then for 12 months, the FAMD or the DIGA in, in German uh, terminology will be for 12 months on the market, prescribed by doctors, fully reimbursed at the price of the manufacturer, and collecting information on the effectiveness of this solution. And then after 12 months, it gets reassessed for um, a final listing on, um, uh, on the directory. And if there is the, uh, a disagreement on the price at which it has to be reimbursed, then the negotiation needs to be entered between the manufacturer and the national health insurance. 
Um, so far, it's been quite successful. Um, this is data as of end of March. I think there's been about 65 applications with positive, uh, 12 positive decisions uh, at the end. I want to move now to the US FDA. USB is really the largest market of healthcare. And I want to talk about how the US has been working to bring, um, you know, uh, the, to, to make basically patients the point of care. Uh, first, some milestones. In 2017, um, the USDA created the Digital Health Unit um, and also launched the Free Search Program. And three years later, they launched the Center for Digital Health Excellence, um, which is a platform meant to educate um, manufacturers as well as other uh, organizations and really foster collaboration between industry and, um, and, the, and the regulators. And in 2021, the FDA also released the first AI ML um, sanity action plan. Um, the way the FDA is doing things is very different from, from Germany. So basically, instead of regulating the products, they are certifying the manufacturer. So as opposed to certifying each release of the software, they certify the manufacturer so that the manufacturer, uh, whatever will come to uh, or out of that manufacturer is uh, meeting some level of safety and effectiveness. And then we have a, um, a cycle that looks a lot like a risk management cycle. So you obtain feedback from, from the market, you obtain feedback from customers, and you uh, reassess again the, uh, uh, the solution, the digital solution. Some anticipated benefits for uh, uh, the FDA um, that they put for themselves as KPIs include, uh, of course, simplicity of business, simplicity of regulatory, uh, process, but also an uh, improved outcome and an improved confidence in these solutions. Uh, last but not least, I want to talk about uh, Japan that um, created the Dutch program that stands for Digital Transformation Action Strategies in Healthcare. Um, these are some lists of approvals in Japan. I will, for the sake of time, just stop on the one that's been approved in late 20. 20 Cure App, which is a nicotine addiction treatment that became the first fully reimbursed and, in fact, the sole fully reimbursed digital solution in Japan. Inside the PMDA, the MHLW has been also quite, um, you know, aware of um, making the regulations easy for uh, uh, to fuel the commercialization of SAMD. These are some of the announcements that were done and uh, reviews of uh, new processes to enhance the, the whole uh, regulatory uh, pathways. I want to just uh, talk about um, the announcement that's been made in March 2021, where the um, MHLW announced the reimbursement or finalizing of the reimbursement um, act for Sandy in view of the medical fees uh, revision of 2022. As well as, yeah, just last month actually, uh, this is worth uh, pointing to, MHW launched a new office, very much like the Digital um, uh, Health Center Excellence in the US. This office will be really focusing on uh, promoting digital health and um, fostering a relationship with the regulator. And just to conclude, I want to leave you with some structural considerations. Um, in fact, I mean, digital health is a paradigm shifter. And with that, we will need new approaches to regulating those, um, uh, those solutions, new rules, but also new expertise. It's also a race. We see that all the countries that have already dominant presence in medtech are racing to make regulatory innovations and keep their uh, you know, influence uh, on the market because they do understand that uh, regulatory is key to um, keep that, that influence. And last but not least, just uh, scalability, um, which really is um, a function of market penetration, which is also a function basically of funding of these innovations, of reimbursement as well as uh, agile regulations. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Asna.
we are going to welcome our next speaker, Mrs. Isabel Isabel Schmitz. He has Europe and International Director of the Fashion Ministry of Health, uh, direct from France, actually. So just as a reminder, this uh, forum today is also broadcasted live. So you don't know, but we have many more French people in this room with us online. <laughs> And uh, so we can hear Mrs. Uh, David Schmitz on the French government perspectives. Isabel, can you hear us? Hello, yes, I perfectly hear you now. Yes. Can you hear me too? Okay, so um, <clears throat> I, I would like to thank you first. Uh, and thank you, especially the French Tech Taiwan and the French office in Taipei, in particular, uh, Mr. Jean-François Casnov, but Maisonave, David Kibler, and their team to make this event happen. It's a pleasure and honor to meet with uh, my colleagues from Taiwan, from the Ministry of Health, the Economic Affairs, and other institutions that are represented here, and obviously to meet with the French tech community in Taiwan. I'd like to also mention that my colleague Antoine de Marassé from the French Health National Agency is in the audience and is joining me in thanking you for, the, for this event. And uh, this is up to uh, our knowledge, uh, the first time such an event happened, and we believe it's a good opportunity to cross-fertilize uh, our projects. So. <laughs> Let's uh, consider it's a uh, first bridge between us, as the beautiful ones you have in Taiwan, between our organizations. Um, I, I'd like to talk to you about the, the EAS roadmap in France, how it is designed and how underlying regulation is supporting its implementation. I'll take some uh, examples of what's the role of uh, regulation between our be behind sorry, our projects. And uh, therefore, I will start with the French Health Ambition presentation, I'll provide you with the, the European perspective on that. Uh, obviously, I'll talk a little bit about the regulation, how we believe it's empowering EALS uh, in our uh, context. And uh, we'll see if we can, uh, therefore, uh, trigger some more areas of uh, cooperation. So, um, as you mentioned, I'm uh, uh, the ELS uh, Europe and International Director for the ELS uh, delegation. You must know that this is the uh, most recent directorate uh, at the Ministry of Health. Our organization is only uh, two years old. And uh, uh, we have also, and we are working very closely with the uh, Digital Health Agency, INS. And um, the INS uh, has been... Uh, uh, providing um, um, all um, um, the key elements of the ELS roadmap for many years now. Uh, another um, key player in the landscape for ELS in France is the Social Insurance, which is a um, big organization supporting uh, the population in France of uh, 67 million inhabitants. We have about uh, 3,000 hospitals and uh, with a fair share between uh, um, public and private hospitals. We are recognized as being the first uh, innovation ecosystem in the health. And one of the key elements we have in France is the Health Data Hub, which is um, uh, the uh, really uh, supporting the ambition uh, in research in AI regarding the use of uh, health data. So, in a few words, this is these are the key pieces, I would say, in the French uh, ELSA landscape. So, to talk to you about the uh, roadmap and how it does connect to Europe, I told you our organization is quite recent. Um, the reason uh, why is uh, that uh, there, there was basically, uh, even if there were some works in ELSA for many years, um, in 2018, there was a report uh, ordered by the government, which paved the way for the uh, um, creation of the ELS uh, delegation uh, at the Ministry of Health. We had uh, um, a vision 
uh, for EELs in France. So the, the translated into a roadmap and a technical doctrine, and we started the implementation back in 2019. Um, a key element, and we'll come back to that, is the um, ethics uh, building blocks of the uh, vision. And uh, we, uh, in 2020, started the um, Ethical Council. Um, in 2021, um, after some months and years of implementation, we uh, uh, are going, uh, we are heading to a major key element of uh, this roadmap. And uh, we believe this year is the year of the citizen. Obviously, due to the pandemics, not all events and initiatives uh, have been taken place as, as uh, planned. However, uh, the uh, ES roadmap is really moving forward in a very aggressive uh, uh, way because we have a three-year acceleration uh, program which has been enhanced now by the uh, European Recovery and Resilience Plan, which is translated in France by the Segur de la Santé, which is the name of the acceleration program um, of uh, the EL strategy. Um, the, the, the roadmap is based in and is divided, I would say, in five great uh, orientations. First one is that we have been renewing and, strengthen, and strengthening the uh, governance in digital health. The second one is, and uh, that's obviously a key element too, is uh, to um, enhance the security and interoperability in digital health. And as you may understand, this is also a, an area where we uh, uh, strongly connect with Europe. We are also rolling out uh, the, um, and accelerating uh, the referral of digital services. And this is where, uh, uh, also, regulation plays an important role. We are extending uh, the, the digital health um, uh, platforms and uh, supporting innovation, stimulating stakeholder involvement. We believe this roadmap is uh, um, accelerated uh, with an ecosystem movement in general, not only by the state, but also by the health professionals the patients and the private companies. So, uh, to make it simple, uh, we represent our vision of the EL strategy as a whole. Indeed, this simple design provides us with the opportunity to clarify what we do expect in terms of roles and responsibilities from the ecosystem in healthcare. And that's very, very important for us. How, how uh, does it uh, actually translate? For, as for host, basically, there are rules for the states, as for the private sector, and as for the citizen. Whenever a citizen wants to build a house, he or she will expect from the state to build the street, ensure the, he gets water, electricity, or the supplies, and uh, that those uh, elements will be accessible uh, for him or for her. So, in, yeah. the, in our case, in this in this case, the state is, will ensure that the streets and supplies, as well as, as the global architecture rules for the house, do respect a framework that the state is providing. And some of those uh, services that are required will be uh, provided by uh, industrial companies. And it is basically exactly the same for EELS. That's what we believe. Uh, it's uh, based on a vision that the state acts as a platform and allows for services to be plugged according to a framework and standards. And obviously, regulation plays an important role in that uh, context. Moreover, and, for, uh, and as for a platform, basically, the state is providing some of the building blocks in terms of services and expect the private companies to be compliant with the standards and the rules of the game. For example, uh, as part of the building block, we have the secured messaging system. We have the patient files, the secure authentication and identification. And uh, part of the key building blocks, you will uh, uh, notice that we have, uh, for instance, the ethics. And uh, as we believe that we cannot move forward 
in health without an ethical framework. And we have uh, um, uh, plenty of uh, working groups working on what it does actually translate in the projects that we um, that we carry. So um, we we you can notice also the European flags on some areas of the house. Uh, as I told you before, this is where we link to the European strategy. I'd like to remind you at this point of time that health is a national competence in Europe, and therefore Europe's role is to ensure consistency and interoperability of national solutions and approaches in order to answer the cross-border healthcare directive of the European Union. And this is where we make those links and where we have with the, the team that uh, Antoine is leading uh, that we want to uh, move forward and ensure that uh, as part of the acceleration of the ELS roadmap in France, we also connect uh, to Europe. Um, we want to... Um, so um, in the next slide, you see how it does translate, translate in the, doc, in the technical doctrine, for example, but also in uh, it will soon translate into genius, which is uh, uh, that, that I'm going to refer to in a few moments. We are part of uh, European joint actions, and we also work very closely with uh, international organization as the uh, World uh, Health Organization and OCDE. An example of what Europe does do in terms of interoperability is the uh, implementation of the European Infrastructure for Health Data, called MyHealth at AU, um, where uh, Europe is um, implementing, and each country being part of it, um, an infrastructure to allow patient data exchange across borders as the patient summary e-prescription and in the future, new uh, services as images result or laboratory discharge report. So France is going live in a few weeks and uh, we are very happy with that. Another uh, area where Europe does connect, I mentioned the health data hub in France, is the fact that we are uh, heading to a common European data space, which will be a kind of single market for the use of uh, health data. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an ambitious uh, project that is expected by uh, um, everyone, I would say, <laughs> research institutes, states, and uh, private companies, because it will allow in Europe to have a huge amount of high quality data for innovation. And uh, we actually are working to um, define the rules for access and use and that will be translated into a regulation that sh that is expected in the next uh, 18 months. Another uh, key example and link to regulations, uh, uh, after I mention you, um, uh, Genius. Uh, Genius is the innovation desk that we have been uh, initiating last October in France. It's a kind of... Uh, um, one single point of contact with all innovators wanted to uh, implement projects and uh, in terms of ELs in France, and we are moving to connect Genius internationally. So um, happy to uh, also have a, a side meeting to to talk about it if you are interested in. Um, it means that we embark industrial companies, as I mentioned before, but also citizens and professionals. And what, the way we do it is that we have very local uh, initiatives and events in order to ensure that we take into consideration expectation of uh, health professionals and citizens. And uh, our main objective in that is to have the right use and the, rate, the right frameworks, tools, and services uh, that are put in that are put in place um, to move forward. Another example of uh, how uh, regulation will help us is um, we we have um, made the assessment that uh, we can trigger innovation in ELs even more if we enforce uh, the use of uh, the standards that are defining the rules of the game. I would say so. Back to the house and the. Uh, uh, role of the state in that. 
So mm -hmm. um, uh, with the acceleration program Segu I mentioned, we we have um, uh, made an assessment of um, what are the required standards and rules. We have also a, a tool uh, called Convergence, which, which allows every uh, stakeholder to assess the maturity he does have in terms of technical uh, doctrine convergence, uh, compliance with the required standards. And uh, we are going to um, enforce the use of standards even more over time. And that means that this translate into a regulatory framework. Another example is also, uh, and I, told, I refer to the year of the citizens, um, as, as from the 1st of January 2002, um, we will um, uh, have my health space, um, which is uh, basically uh, oh. like a, an app that will foster patient access to um, health uh, data. So each citizen will have access to that. It will be created for each citizen because we have uh, taken an opt-out approach to implement it. And that means that we have been uh, translating this into um, the law. So uh, my health space, which is the translation of uh, mon espace santé. And uh, what is uh, basically the role of the law in uh, this implementation? We have uh, uh, in the law uh, the fact that uh, there is this automatic creation of uh, my health space. The law also defines the main principle, principles and uh, the law also uh, acts um, as, a, as a basically um, imposed the opt-out uh, principle. So this is translated into an implementing, uh, implementing decreasory uh, and has been validated by the Data Privacy Institution and the Council of State in France. So what I want to illustrate is that uh, beyond uh, what you can, uh, um, what the citizen will face, we have actually a huge work in terms of regulatory framework to make it simple and to make it happen in the uh, due, due timeframe. For example, the law defines the type of services that are eligible and the conditions uh, for the uh, access of uh, patient data. And though this is also necessary to be compliant with the uh, ethical framework uh, I mentioned before. So to illustrate also this, we have uh, uh, 30 uh, services that are that are compliant and will be the first ones to, to be live on the App Store as from the 1st of January uh, 2022. <clears throat> uh, regarding the uh, European Acceleration Programme, which is translated into the Segur de la Santé in France, uh, to provide you with some key elements is the fact that we have uh, 2 billion euros on the table to accelerate the strategy. And we are targeting uh, key building blocks uh, like the patient summary, the secure messaging system, the structured pa patient record, and so on. So uh, by health profession, we are committing to uh, accelerate the use of uh, ELs. And therefore, we also um, are consistent with the European vision uh, that has been, um, uh, uh, I would say, reinforced, uh, uh, so to say, by the pandemic crisis. How are we doing this? Is that we put in place and we use the regulatory framework to uh, um, actually implement this very quickly in two phase, uh, addressing both the patients and the health professional and the industrial companies by, uh, so to say, lifting and upgrade uh, the software offerings towards the expected standards. And that means that we have incentive measure measures in place. And in a second time, we'll be enforcing that with the regulatory framework. 
and the same for I would say for patients where and health prof uh, sorry for health professionals where we will finance the use of uh, uh, health uh, data sharing and uh, make it compulsory uh, in a second time. So we help, but in a second time we enforce the use of um, the the compliance framework. Another example is uh, obviously, uh, like in uh, most countries, the uh, crisis um, of the COVID-19 has been also uh, translated in years by the rise of TLEs. We have an ad hoc regulation. It has been part of uh, the strategy, national strategy for years, but we have been uh, um, um, invited to also to adapt the regulation to uh, uh, make it possible to accelerate it during the crisis. We also had a regulatory framework to allow to the, the implementation of tracing app and uh, now for uh, the digital green certificate, um, which is a European initiative and where France is a piloting country. We are already live nationally and in two weeks time, we'll move to the um, European interoperability to allow uh, French citizens and tourists to um, um, to uh, move uh, from country to country as from this summer. And uh, this is uh, uh, where ELS is also uh, helping the mobility of uh, citizens. Obviously, it has been translated in uh, ad hoc regulation um, at European level, but also at uh, national level to make it happen in a few weeks. So it's possible to make it happen with uh, the support of the European framework. So next up for France is, uh, and uh, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to mention that we are going to uh, be in the presidential seat of the European Union as from the 1st of January, 2022. And uh, that means that we'll be also helping the uh, EL's uh, European agenda um, during that period of time. And um, that's uh, that's very uh, something very uh, uh, which is uh, providing a lot of enthusiasm. So uh, thank you a lot for your invitation, and happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Isabel, for this presentation, I have to speak very simply on the development test. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Joe Raoul, the Director General of Taiwan for the Job and Inscription. It's my pleasure today to share with you some of my framework and strategies about regulating medical devices related to digital health in Taiwan. Actually, everyone focuses on me because <laughs> I control the regulations and it is for me to speed up the products. This I also hope so. But we must have, have some people to check out the safety facilities. Today, this is my outline. Uh, it will include a framework and uh, strategies. Okay, part one is the framework of medical devices in the area of digital health. Uh, in Taiwan, the medical device regulatory frameworks include the market registration and the post market surveillance. Since 1973, device registration began. So we have we ask the manufacturers must pass the registration of the approval. Um, everyone, all of the manufacturers must follow the quality system management. It means they must follow the TMP. So TMP implementation started in 1999. And we also have the ISO. ISO is a 7485. This is the international standard. And we also have the distribution management. So this one, the distributors also are deregulated by the TDG. It's very important for those products. 
at the lab, we have the post market surveillance. We want to make sure the safety of the products. So this is our framework. And about the medical device app, this may it is fully involved. So uh, this main is the milestone. It's very important. This app has some purpose. Uh, our aim is to advance development and innovation. I give you one example. And just now we talk about the software development and the designers. They can apply the license under their own name. I think this is the big encouragement for them because they can do something for themselves, not just for their boss. So I hope this is the only for them. And the TFDA also have some great focus to have a validity period. It means we will give them the condition of approval. So uh, we can give them the innovative products very quickly, but not five years, maybe two years, three years, or four years. But anyway, we want to speed up the products to the market. Um, to enhance regulation of a diverse body technology. In the past, uh, we have uh, some manufacturing or sales, uh, for example, but right now we also include incorporate uh, maintenance and uh, repairment. It means that if you belong to the technicians, uh, you are also incorporated into regulations. So I think it's very important for medical devices. And we try to fulfill regulation by risk classification. So for low risk devices, they will be changed to online listing. Unnecessary to get a registration. So this one will speed up the product. And uh, we try to set up clinical trial framework. Clinical trial is a big work. So I think we have, we have to scale about it. The right now for some uh, no significant risk. It's unnecessary to get a global growth authority. So if you just have that IRP in the hospital, you can do it. And we also try to strengthen role in the distribution management. So we must follow the TDP, food distribution practice. And we also uh, we involve post market surveillance. Okay, uh, there are some there are some thinking about the cross sector integration. You know, in Taiwan, we have very outstanding medical professionals and the very good ICT technology. But how to integrate them into another unicorn? That's our goal. It's possible, it's possible. So we try to do it now. Yeah, we hope this one works. So this one can create a lot of things. So this one can have innovative application and a service model. And then we also combine with big data. I think we have we will have an internet cloud platform. And hospitals and the physicians will give high quality service to patients or consumers. About application, I will give you some examples like medical image analysis or gene sequencing analysis. This one is also the key step for precision medicine. And this is a pathological sector analysis. You also have other methods like fluorescence analysis and ECT analysis. There are many, many applications. Right now, we have uh, such techniques, but I think if uh, we combine with the AI, this one will can do more things. This one will have uh, broaden, broaden scopes, so the service will be better. And the part two is the strategies for regulatory management and assistance of industry development. So let me see. The cross sector integration of healthcare and uh, electronic information. This is the cross sector companies and this is the healthcare like hospitals. In Taiwan, right now, there are 
in 2019, there, there were uh, 1,600 manufacturers, but only 10%, 10%, 156 domestic manufacturers related to software as medical devices. And all of them right now just focus on computer aided detection software. They can do more, not just this one. Not only detection, but also diagnosis and other, other ways to help patients. So we hope integration between ICT and the medicine since one can create more products. <clears throat> And about the critical factors in promoting innovation development of AI medical device industries, there are some issues. There are some issues because um, ICT, ICT manufacturers are so excellent in your field. And you might not be familiar with the regular terminology of the medical devices, but it's okay, we will have you. We will have you. And you also need a platform for communicating or matching with the medical field. And we will try to do it if you need. If you have your very good brains, you start here, that is enough. But if you need some help, let us know. Let us know. We will have you. And we also need qualified personnel. Uh, I think this one is, is needed in any field. But right now, many people say we lack of such personnel. It's okay, we will try and educate more for you. And sometimes I say you need a team to help you, to run with you, so we will do it also. And the establishment of uh, this medical device project office, um, this Friday, this Friday, yes, the day after tomorrow, we will have uh, the view of this office. It's very important because we want to everyone know we have a strong ambition to do something for you. So this office will be created. So please join us this Friday. Okay. <laughs> uh, what will we do? We will try to implement consultation and assistance for special cases. Those special cases belong to class two or three, and it will be where we are applied registrations in Taiwan. But you need some help, so we will help you. So we just search for such special cases. And now we also try to conduct some training and promotion activities. And we will establish a single entry website for internet platform. And uh, we need a website, our office will also help you. And we will provide some assistance in developing Development policies and guidance. If you understand, we will help you with the policies and regulations. That's why we need your help. Because you are too smart. Too smart to create a lot of things. But regulation, just stay here. You have to go to this stage. So sometimes let us know and we can have some discussion and the value that the information comes true. Okay. Mm -hmm. I hear. There will be some strategies for promoting such software. So later I will show you, uh, we, will, we will try to refine regulatory scope of uh, software as medical device. And uh, uh, some clinical trials, uh, what, what will be the change? And uh, some guidance. And we will try actively search for some potential cases and conduct some seminars. Our purpose is to accelerate time to market, to have you have your products in the market as soon as possible, as soon as speed of the construction. So first, we will define regulatory scope. Uh, so how, what will we do? Actually, in 2015, we announced the reference guidance and the let you know some products not belong to a medical device. But some of you don't know it, so you always ask or criticize. 
that we, we have too much regulation. The number of land are necessary to pass our registration. So here, if you don't relate it to disease diagnosis and treatment, it's unnecessary to be medical device. You have your products, then you can get those products into the market directly. Okay. So for home use, if you just just the general awareness, it's unnecessary to apply for medical device. For medical care institution use, also the same. If you just use the name to store or look up patient patients, or for remote medical care, to transfer or receive physiological measures values. So, so on. Those is unnecessary to apply. But if you relate to diagnosis and treatment, it's different. You must come to PMBA and get the blood approval. Um, the second part of this uh, the clinical trials. So the clinical trials are uh, the same. If this situation, it is not a software software as a medical device. Or uh, there is no subjects we are being recruited. It's unnecessary to get approvals of PFDA if you want to start the clinical trial, but actually it's a um, there is no subjects. Uh, even though you have some subjects, but uh, just get uh, related with the logical parameter status. That's okay. It's unnecessary to get our approval. And before some, something, some software has been marketed in its use, it means it's also unnecessary to apply the clinical trials. So there are um, there are many ways you can skip this thing. But if you don't know about it, you can ask us, we will help you. And let you know, there is one need for life. And uh, so we will announce some related review guidance. Guidance are very important for manufacturers. If you don't have guidance, you will be scared about what will be asked by PFDA. So we will let you know. So please check that. Please check those guidance. In 2017, we have the guidance about the validation. In 2019, we have the cyber security. 2020, we also give you the guidance on registration and market approval. So you can check it and know what is our requirement. And we just check it and know which one you should prepare. In 2020, we also have a reference guidance uh, about the categorization and the classification. Some people <coughs> don't know which one uh, their products belong to which products. That's one less more category. So sometimes we will feel confused. A big machine must be category. No, sometimes it just belong to category. But for some implementation, the one we have belong to category. So if you don't know that, you can ask us. Okay. And fourth, we actively search for case sources. So we want to explore the right person to develop us and to 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 give us a good feedback. So here, this is always. We will do a lot of things. We will search for the good cases and we will give you consultation. And we also have a advisory committee to help to advocate the review time. And uh, we will do a lot of trainings and harmonize the international guidance or regulations. And right now, if you want to get more information, we are for remote services. So you can check our online web page or consultation hotline. Please use them. For local service, we also have a civil personnel can give you service at your site. If you want, you also can have a staff reservation and we will give a special consultation. For some in-depth service, for some special cases, we can do a lot of, a lot of things, but let us know you need help. We will help you. It's very important. Okay. <laughs> 
So right now we also have uh, some outcomes, not not so many. Because TM now, TM now, we just have uh, 40 applications. It's very few. I hope it's about 4,000 or more. Yeah, but right now we just have 40. <laughs> and this, we will conduct the seminars in this year. This year, there will, there will be more than 70, 70 training courses. So, for example, we will have a certified regulatory seminars, international conferences, and the 27 education, educational training courses, 40 regulatory workshops, and so on. And we can give you more if you need. Okay. So, under effective management of competent authorities and the continuous enhancement of the industry. The public has the access to step effective and uh, high quality products. Heavily also try to harmonize with international regulations because we want to promote the development of air medical devices. Our purpose is uh, we work together and create win-win situations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu. Now we would like to welcome our uh, yes, speakers yes, for a panel discussion, uh, which will be moderated by Hagnam. Um, well, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, first, I want to reintroduce um, you know, the topic of today, just to refocus after our mid break. Um, basically, today we will be talking about digital health, which uh, I define as the coalescence between healthcare and technology. Um, we know that transportation, finance, uh, the entertainment, and just about every industry is undergoing a huge reimagining in the face of technology. And um, yet, um, healthcare remains a bit under disrupted by technology. And I would argue for good reasons, as a regulatory person myself, we're dealing with human lives. So we have to be very careful with you know, the safety and effectiveness of the solutions we put on the market. At the same time, we also know that patient expectations are shifting as they adopt more and more technology, particularly since the global pandemic. Um, Taiwan's five plus two innovative industries plan, as well as the six core strategic industries program, both have digitalization and healthcare at their center in addition to an undisputable global pole position in the semiconductor industry. Similarly, France has a long tradition of medical practice and innovation excellence. It is therefore not a coincidence that both countries are looking to deepen their collaboration based on exchange of best practices and mutually beneficial partnerships. So clearly this is a huge topic. We've got something like 50 minutes to um, discuss um, a lot. Um, and uh, we will open the floor also to questions. Um, perhaps two to three questions time permitting. So I'd like to welcome our panelists. Thank you very much for joining us. We have, um, I will start from, from that end, uh, Mr. Ray Chen, who is, um, uh, founder and CEO of Long Good Meditech. We have Mr. Maybe we just like say hi. <laughs> um, we have Ed Deng, who is the co-founder and CEO of Health to Sync. We have Mr. Anthony Jones, who is the head of virtual healthcare at Sanofi Hong Kong and Taiwan. We have Dr. Shongwei Wu, who is the Director General of the Taiwan FDA. We have Mr. Ko uh, Chang Lee, Director General of the National Health Insurance. Uh, we have Professor Ray Jade Chen, Professor at the Taipei Medical University and former Superintendent of the Taipei Medical University Hospital. We have Mr. Andy Liu, Smart Health Director at ASUS Club. And finally, we have 
Mr. Brian Chong, Vice President of Wistron Medical Technology. So I'd like to start us with um, um, just a generic question to every one of you, perhaps two minutes each. Um, you know, I moved to Taiwan in uh, January 2020, and every time I met with a manufacturer, I was told, Taiwan is a very small market. If we want to grow our business, we have to export. Uh, we have to go outside of Taiwan. The population is very small. Which sometimes translates, I don't know what sometimes, perhaps or might actually translate into disinterest in shaping local regulations. Um, in your view, and feel free to uh, chime in uh, in different orders, in your view, why does it matter to create an agile regulatory and reimbursement framework for software as medical device here in Taiwan? How would these benefit the local population? and the industry, including for export. You'd like to start? Sure. Uh, you need a mic. Good afternoon. So I, I represent obviously the industry. I will give you the perspective of a multinational company operating in Taiwan. So I, I think the way multinational companies work and such in mind, which is we are competing so, for instance, I'm representing Taiwan. We are competing uh, with 50 or 60 different countries. So we need to present the, the, the most reliable uh, case to our project so that they can really allocate resources to invest. So to, to your point, I think what is really important is to have predictability. We are in healthcare, so healthcare is long cycles. And it's even digital health from the idea to the development, and then you want to test it, and of course safety is the most important concern. So we will only uh, you know, get results after a few years, and then you need to register to the TFDA, then you might want to go to NHIA. So we're talking about the seven to eight year potentially, uh, potentially long process. So we need really predictability. That's really important to know the rules. And the other thing I wanted to say, I think all of us here in the healthcare industry, it's all about innovation. And innovation is about risk. So we, we, we are willing as an industry to take risk on science. Maybe only 10%, 20% of our products solution will actually go to the market. But we don't want on top of that kind of inherent innovation risk, either a regulatory. So it's, it's really important. And it was really nice to see that there is an openness to, to have a dialogue. That when we when we design a product, we can have some certainty. And, and we Hi, my name is Ray, and what we do is general rehabilitation. That is, uh, uh, what is used to be done in the hospital with connected to with the dispatch you know, solution to people at home, especially uh, during the COVID-19. So most of the uh, patient and uh, My view that rehabilitation is that way is very one of the most important department in the hospital to be consistent uh, doing. But the challenge is that if one or two they didn't go to the hospital to keep in your rehabilitation, you wouldn't go down. So people just uh, during the COVID-19, they are just some part of them is afraid to go to the hospital for the course consultation uh, in the facility. So our challenge is that just so we want to have a solution and go to a, a remote area. You know, what is the most uh, highest death rate and also the highest risk of a strong patient? What is, a, what is the most uh, serious one in Taiwan? That is important in Taiwan. Taiwan, sorry. So uh, uh, we want to solve the problem by using the framework application to help them keep, keep it on the replication. So the challenge is that we cannot claim uh, in, in, our, in our government is open. Uh, it is a telemedicine. Uh, it is a, it is legal. So consequently, it could be have some uh, national insurance to uh, support for that. But will the but, but the definition of care application is still ambiguous. So whether it's legal or not, whether it can be uh, paid by national insurance is, is is consequently not allowed. So we're still working on and we're trying to find a way to do it. Now we do this in charity to some of the university or some of the. Uh, uh, through the bio system to help them 
So this is one of the issues that come here. And we're thinking about some of the common sense that we should work on this one. The term application is it legal or uh, how can we just uh, if the third is, is not application side, then this is the identify a legal uh, procedure. Only I'm ready, but I guess I'll improvise. Um, so I think as the smallest company on this panel, I read the here to which one is so um you, you know, seeing uh, Director General Wu what she presented, I can't ask her to be to run faster. I can't. I can't ask her to be more agile. So I'll take another approach. Um, if if y'all think about it, um, if there wasn't reimbursement to begin with globally, would we see the trillion dollar pharmaceutical industry that we see? Most likely not. So now if you go back to the 1960s to the 1990s, that was the first 30 years where we, we saw the pharmaceutical industry grow to $100 billion in, 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 in market value. Coincidentally, those 30 years was also the time where markets like Germany and US really started to introduce reimbursement. So my, the point I'm trying to get across is reimbursement. Now, if we, if we look at our closest neighbor, Japan, in the 80s and the 90s, um, they had a lot of foreign competition from, from Sanofi, from Pfizer, etc. But uh, they grew domestically. Before competing globally, they grew domestically. They had to grow in their home markets first. So my point is, if we all believe that the digital health industry SAMD won't become a large industry. By the way, it, it currently is around $50 billion. My rough estimation, if you add a few companies in the US, the market value is around $50 billion. Right? So we haven't hit that first $100 billion mark yet. Coming back to my Taiwanese enterprise, uh, to answer your question directly. If we, as a Taiwanese enterprise, if we are to have a seat at the table as a global industry, global to compete globally, we need to start in Taiwan. And, um, and I think reimbursement policy is key. So again, regulatory is important, but regulatory paves the way so that reimbursement can happen there. And uh, again, I can't ask for more agility from, uh, from the community. But I think reimbursement is a key. It is very important to create an NGR regulatory system. Why? Because Taiwan, Taiwan is small, but so small. 23 million people population here. It's not quite small, but we are not a country in the world. So we have to work hard and to compete with others. That's why we have to do another things. So here I want to let you know. Uh, Taiwan is trying to do a lot of things because we want our industry, our companies have a good future. So we want you can work with uh, can compete with the world. So that's why we have uh, so many guidance and many supporting systems to help you. So I hope we can call together and uh, I hope you, you know uh, it's our goal. It's, it's just our our mission. So we will do it. It's very simple. So we have to do it. Okay. <coughs> I think uh, business is business, yeah. <laughs> so this is today why I come here. <laughs> you know, in Taiwan, our health is a very unique national health issue in the world. Yeah. I think not our country can compare with Taiwan. Yeah. Since I was in this job for almost around five years, yeah. So in the, in the past, I'm the professor of surgery, especially transportation in the National Chung University. So I have all my own idea, yeah. <clears throat> Why I want to say that is because in Taiwan, can I can have my, my side. Can I have my PowerPoint? I have to want to really know the true fact. <laughs> <laughs> because generally, you know, when you uh, for each industrial company, yeah, you try to promote your product and you wish the Taiwan National Health Insurance can revert everything. Yeah. But where is money? This is very important. Yeah. But today, I'm just a CEO of the NGIA. Yeah. So I know, and uh, you know, last year, during the December 31st, yeah, my, my minister of our nation, of uh, 
Mr. Uh, Harris and Wei Wei, Chen Song, yeah, he just mentioned that uh, we try to promote the premium, yeah, to the, to I mean to the five point <coughs> to the I mean five four five point one seven, yeah. So it is a challenge for us, and you know, uh, the man high paid COVID sir, yeah. he just mentioned why you could raise the premium, but you don't, uh, I mean, you don't I mean, uh, I mean what do you? You don't quit your job, yeah. Those people is in charge for us. Yeah. Today, what I want to let you know is in Taiwan, the national health insurance is safe. We have a grow market. So you can see, okay, you can see in this in this one, yeah. The red line, yeah. The red line it means each year how many medical performance we the point we, we, we did in Taiwan, yeah. But actually, you know, the I mean the, the blue line, yeah. It means the raw budget we have. So in that way, each year it is a uh, we we, we uh, in Taiwan yeah, with many 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 brackets they did a lot of work, but we cannot get the re reasonable reward because we just cut. because generally one point equal to one dollar Taiwan dollar, but now we need to change one point to uh, to zero zero point nine Taiwan dollar yeah. So this is very unfair to all the medical providers. Yeah. This is one thing I want to let you know. And then the second line is that in Taiwan, yeah, we have many, many even up row, up arrow. It means that in Taiwan, we offer many, many money to a drug. drug yeah. So for a pharmaceutical company, well, you see even Taiwan is a small island, but many pharmaceutical companies, they are very happy because in Taiwan, if this drug can be enrolled into the Taiwan market, that it means the guarantee. Because in Taiwan, we don't have a commitment. Our commitment is very, very small. But in our country, you always say, oh, yeah, this, this, uh, this uh, innovative drug is already in the market in our country. But I say, generally, in that country, the, the people there, the patients there, they have a commitment. So the market is very limited. But in Taiwan, it's different. Because we have a raw budget, we just share this information. So I want to let you know. And the next thing is that uh, in Taiwan, we think that lack of the examination, examination, it means uh, well, that you, you check the, the rough sugar, yeah, that. but in the other one, we pay a lot of money. Yeah. This is one thing I want to let you know. And uh, this is just, uh, I mean, I, I, should, I, I just skip this one. Because here, yeah, in January in Taiwan, yeah, we pay a lot of money just in our patient clinic. But in Taiwan, you know, the quicker year is always inpatient. But we don't have enough money. This is unfair to many, many. I mean, a family surgeon or a family physician, they work in the hospital, but they cannot get a reasonable, reasonable reward. But generally, you know, in the outpatient clinic, yeah, or especially in the local clinic, they always find another, I mean, the tiger to get more money. Yeah. It is, well, it's very difficult. But in Taiwan, I think we have we are very proud. You, we always say, talking about that we have big data. In the NC, we have a very successful crowd. In any way, so we can get many, many information. So many, many companies, they told me that they, they wish to cooperate with, with RHIA to get in, in, enough information to do more the product. And then, you know, in Taiwan, we try to, I mean, enroll many, we call it email, and uh, I know email, and uh, email on quality truck, it means an email separate truck or something, because something very new. But in Taiwan, we have many, many different hospitals. They just use this truck, and then we can get the real world, real world data. So in that way, it is very useful for many, many companies. Yeah. So this is what I want to say. Taiwan even is a small island, but Taiwan we have a very fixed world budget. It is very powerful for different companies to, to get this, this uh, I mean, resource. Okay, this is all. <laughs> I would like to add. Um, uh, good afternoon. Um, as far as our own experience, we're, we're very happy to see the change in uh, management practice of TFDA. Uh, five years ago, it was totally very different. So today, we're very glad to hear terms like re regulatory innovation and the regulatory management of China. And that's a very big change in the role of a regulatory body. It used to be more like policemen, now it's an enabler. And enabling an industry to grow is very, very important. 
Uh, in Taiwan, we all know that the, the primary driver of the economy, aside from the semiconductor and the ICT industry, is a lot of very small and medium-sized businesses. And, and a lot of the software companies are also very small. So if you do the regulatory practices as in the past, a lot of this won't even see the light of day. They will probably go bankrupt before they go big. And it's very important to get the approval in Taiwan is because once you go abroad uh, and talk to other hospitals, they say, what are the references in Taiwan? Do you have regulatory approval in Taiwan? So that is a very basic requirement for getting offshore laws for software as medical device. And that's why we're very, very glad to see all the changes that are happening. Thank you. Yeah, I think the uh, um, following uh, the general professor Lee, as uh, Dr. Amada four months ago, I was superintendent of Alaska. I always ask the money and from the nation that puts injuries, they have more money. But I stepped down and then I think Taiwan, and the professor just mentioned about we can use the data and try to apply into the SAMD. Previous uh, Taiwan's all the industry always they always think about it. It's a hardware thinking. Because of the you know the business in the world only two things. One thing is service, one thing is product. So the service, because Taiwan is small, so we are in the our, in this island, we can only service 23 million people. And we can only but we use the product we can export it to everywhere. But the invitation for Taiwan, we are not the English, we are not the nature. Okay, so our product we need. And then another, if we want to the service for the world, the English is an is, is obstacle. And then, but however, I think that more and more people, Taiwan is become after this pandemic. We can see we have become more internationalized. And the Taiwan's national health actually is quite strong, a lot of the productivity. So I think we can, especially the deregulation from the TFA and TFDA, and then also mention about the you know the security and the privacy, the policy. We once used the GDPR, and then it's possible for the you know the health scale, the industry. We can try to use the, the data. And the, the data not only limited to the national health insurance. And then we can from the, the hospital and then from the you know from the company, they from the so-called the electronic health data. And then get together. Taiwan 23 million people, I think this island is densely populated, but however, very, very good health care system. So therefore, our you know knowledge from our data come out and knowledge will be a good example, especially if we can you know make the health scale cost down. I think that's the point. The SMD is not just the increase of the money. I think if you want to the next the pair, the insurance company, then you, you can cost down, and then. I think the SMB can export it to everywhere in the world. I think that's the purpose of our and this meeting here. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing uh, for bringing up the point that in fact one of the promises of uh, of digital health is to reduce overall healthcare costs. Um, just to stay a little bit more on the reimbursement, since it seems a bit of a, a hot topic, and um, I was uh, my question for Professor Lee. Uh, you know, in what way you think that the current reimbursement criteria and, and structures uh, may be unfit for digital health, um, for you know overall value assessment of, of software as medical device? Very good question. Yeah, even uh, so far, so so many drug or some and and I mean, medical, medical device. I always ask my colleague if a um, patient said that if this is really good for a patient, we try to enroll. Into the, our our HIA, and then each month we have a um, some expert meeting together. They will discuss whether this medical device or this drug is really good for our people, our people or our patients. Yeah. So 
in the past, maybe for some new device or for some uh, uh, drug, yeah, they, all, they are always just following the list. It's not very easy to be drawn into our NGI yeah. But recently, we found many, many drugs they just entered our market. But the, I, I just mentioned that this is uh, our raw budget that is fixed. So if the drug is more, yeah, then other uh, reward for the medical providers, I mean the I mean the point, the, the value of point will decrease. Yeah. So uh, the next month, next week, you know, the superintendent from the National Taiwan University, Wu Mixian, the superintendent from Tai and Taipei Veterinary Hospital, Xu Wei, they want to reach me. They just want to discuss. I mean, I mean the, the, this this situation, yeah. So I just want to say that in Taiwan, you don't need to worry. If you think this is very good for a patient, you have confidence. We and I will cooperate with you, yeah, to let this drug be applied for a Taiwan market. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move, um, uh, change slightly topics, just um, mentioning that in September 2020, the um, Health to Think, which is a Taiwan-based digital health startup, entered a partnership with the pharma giant Sanofi to apply the digital health solution in 300 clinics in, in Taiwan. Um, I, it is, uh, in my view, a great example of how future healthcare will, services will look like particularly in the um, field of collaborations between um, you know, drug uh, manufacturers and, and SAMD manufacturers. Uh, first question to uh, Mr. Anthony Jones. Um, what was the story and rationale behind Sanofi's decision to collaborate with SAMD companies in Taiwan? And why especially or specifically health to see? Thank you, Asna. So I think I want to echo uh, all the different participants. I think Taiwan, I mean, certainly Sanofi, we don't see Taiwan as a small country at all. <laughs> we, we think it's actually an ideal place for innovation. And that's why, for example, they send someone like me, French, <laughs> French national to, to Taiwan, is really to benefit from the ecosystem of Taiwan. So obviously we have regulation, we have uh, reimbursements. I can say we have a progressive government uh, which understands disease management and there's already a diabetes program which is not, not digital but it's a, it's a disease management program showing uh, the importance of prevention and also good treatment. So that, that's further reason why Taiwan and then and, and of course the data, the database, the ability to get uh, result outcome that can be then translated. And once we have result for Taiwan, we don't see Taiwan as the end goal. Uh, for instance, I'm talking to my Japanese colleagues. We're thinking about Middle East. I mean, once we can prove something is successful in Taiwan, thanks to the ecosystem, then we can move forward. And, and why uh, else to think it's because Sanofi is really uh, one of the key providers of insulin. For diabetic patients. So we were really looking to, to collaborate with an innovative uh, startup in that field. And, it, and we wanted also ideally a Taiwanese startup. Uh, just because healthcare is so specific country by country, so it would make a lot of sense in Taiwan to collaborate with the Taiwanese. So that's, that's really uh, how it started. We screened the market and we thought that the thing was already uh, you know, present with uh, patients, with doctors, with a solution which was already on the market. And I think we started, and uh, Marjorie is here we, with several people uh, in Singapore, in Taiwan, and we started the dialogue. And then we were very pleased with the partnership. Thank you. Um, similarly, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Deng, um, in what way the partnership with Sanofi was crucial to your business as well as to your Taiwanese patients in your view? So, Director General Lee is correct, right? Uh, business is business. And uh, and to Brian's earlier point, we, uh, we're, we're a startup and uh, our, our, our money, our capital is limited, our time is limited. And so one of the reasons why we, we decided to partner with Sanofi was it, it was a business, it was a business decision. Sanofi is the number one, they have the best technology in, in basal insulin. 
the, the number one market share will be the Bayesian system. So naturally speaking, it makes sense to work with them because beyond Taiwan, right? And they mentioned Japan, possibly the Middle East and Europe. Um, how do we scale beyond Taiwan as a Taiwanese enterprise? If we were to do this alone, we technically could, right? It would take us two to three times uh, the, the, the amount of time required in capital. Um, capital, okay, it's a human. And um, so, the, so the decision was simple as well. Work with a, a leading player that has their best technology in the soul and, uh, and deploy with them, right? So I think the, 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 the critical point was, yes, we still have to show uh, patient efficacy. We still have to show outcome. Right? We still have to prove to TFDA that the quality is managed properly. And, and that's, that's our job. Um, but, uh, but the role after that is, is about deployment. And that's where we thought uh, some of would be a good partnership to, to lift us beyond Taiwan. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it's always a surprise. Well, I, I want to I want to come back to the um, ICT industry and uh, with a question to, to Mr. Liu. Um, you know, you you have moved from Mr. I'm not told. Uh, to or you told me actually to uh, in this cloud to um, their department uh, of smart health um, and where you offer B2B services um, for uh, integrated information systems um, and uh, when we spoke in preparation for this event you mentioned that you had the chance to work with hospitals based in Thailand and others in Japan as well as in Taiwan and um, you um, the experiences were different, and I'd like to hear from you in what way these uh, businesses were, or say, these markets are, are different uh, when compared to Taiwan. What can I say is everyone just to know that um, Taiwan's IT company, Taiwan's uh, capability, especially for our semiconductor and our uh, IT companies, is powerful, right? So, um, our IT environment is good, okay? The genetic hardware, the software, resources, also are covered, okay? So we can pass also to uh, the vets, okay, to implement for our the, uh, new technology, especially for the smart vets. But currently, um, I just find the two kinds of the issue happen uh, unique in Taiwan. Okay, the first one, our own population and the health industry the scale. Um, we are not as large as global company. Okay. So how to promote and how to deliver our business model and our solution package. Okay to the world, especially Taiwan is not so big. So our um, our overall the resources, especially for our um, how to say that, the smart health requires a lot of resources, okay, for the innovation development, especially in the um, Development uh, stage. So, how to use our the solution and uh, how to integrate our the total solution to sell to global market? There is to think about it. Okay. Taiwan has high density. The cluster, cluster, okay, especially for the IT company, okay. and uh, we have a high capability, uh, capability the power, um, focus on the uh, smart medical. So, I just uh, face uh, some of the customer just uh, ask for me, Andy, Taiwan's IT company. The more sell the solution to us. You just 
to the mall, it's just a theory about, okay, you are the uh, feature, you're the code on the spec, it's a more the powerful, it's a functional, it's a very good, but uh, how to set up after service in the real field, after service is the last mile for the advantage of all the ecosystem. So the after service, if the user uses your system is shut down, the application system, it doesn't work. Device damage, how to recover? Okay, how to uh, reset, how to respond for the system, especially for the application. So this we need to consider about our the last mile of the after service, how to satisfy our the end user. That is Taiwanese company, we have to uh, work together and uh, um, integrate our capability. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question from the audience for, for Dr. Wu. I just do not let the audience, um, you know, at the very last. Um, Dr. Wu, someone from the audience asked whether there will be um, an expedited process in place, I mean, put in place, compared to traditional medical devices, since AI medical device evolution um, is expected to be fast and, and an ever-changing process. It's true. Comparing the traditional medical devices, AI medical devices are different. So right now, we try to have an injured um, regulatory system, and we hope we can have a very strong mechanism to help our industries. But right now, I'm not sure which one you think the one is not enough. There are some guidance or some guidance for you. This is a, this part we can put the body and we try to hurry up and But I, I believe there are something we, we have not done right now. So we will try to do that as soon as possible and do our best. So if you think something we should improve, we will do it. Sometimes many industries come to me and the children have some discussions. They give me some good points or some opinions. So I accept them. And sometimes I think them because they remind me and give me new impact. So I will try to do it uh, for you. Yeah, for you. And that is your industry can grow. Thank you. Um, I'm told we still have 10 more minutes to, uh, for this panel discussion. So I'll be asking my last question, which um, is really about, um, you know, the innovative nations being very, very much deliberate about engaging in partnerships um, between industry and, and the regulators, as you, as you just mentioned, Dr. Wu, uh, but also um, between different uh, different agencies, you know, internationally. Um, for example, the IMDRF, which is the International Medical Devices Regulators Forum. Um, regulators get together, they talk to each other to innovate um, and not reinvent the wheel uh, every time. So I'd like to hear from each one of you, um, you know, how you see different um, French and Taiwanese stakeholders collaborate to foster the best digital health ecosystem in Taiwan. Um, yeah, so um, please share your, uh, your insight. Just a tough one, I'm still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a representative of a French company, I would be really glad to help this kind of collaboration uh, happen. I think, we, unfortunately, we could not really hear Isabel uh, from the French Ministry of Health very well, but there were some initiatives that I'm aware of that I think are, are really uh, good initiatives, and then we could think about how to uh, implement them in Taiwan. If one of them was called Genius, and I think the idea of genius is basically putting together people from the industry, people from the government, uh, people from uh, the civil society, the citizen, people from uh, the medical association, everybody together and, and work together to, to create a framework rather than, uh, as we were saying before, having like policemen and then uh, it's completely 
the, the, the game has completely changed. It's everybody trying to work together um, to make it a safe environment for the patients, but also create a positive impact for the So that's one of the initiatives, and I think if MOH from France and from Taiwan can work together. And on the other side, there's a lot of uh, good initiatives from Taiwan, especially uh, tracking of data. I mean, Taiwan is more advanced, I would say, <laughs> in certain areas, and France, you know, and again, I think with the French study, with French companies, uh, we would really like to, to foster this dialogue. Okay. My turn. <laughs> France is a wonderful country. France has a very good imagination. We need imagination. In Taiwan, even though we are so small and uh, just a small island, so it's different from your country, from France. But there are many countries besides you. You, you have many neighbors. Our neighbor is not so good. Yeah. <laughs> So, yes. so you can you can go to those those countries and uh, to interact with them, and then you can stimulate your thinking and try to think why they can do it, why they can have very good products, and you can do it instantly. But in Taiwan, I don't think that will be. So we need your help. We need uh, friends to be our good friends. Yeah. So. That's why we, we need such cooperation. Right now, everything is so so good. Of course, we also have AI. So if we need, we can use the internet. We can communicate directly at the initial time. So I mean, actually, uh, friends is very good, and I like friends very much because of the like, solo meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think actually we, we can cooperate again. Um, and uh, if you want to have uh, some other, some other few things, sorry, things we can discuss, it's okay because this is just the starting. I think we need more communication. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Taiwan and uh, France have a lot of similarity. Yeah, we like the food. Good food. <laughs> and uh, actually, we are democratic. Yeah, but I think that between the, the dangerous areas, but I think the friends have a lot of uh, very good in the intensive transplantation, especially in this part. And uh, also in the, in the critical care part, that is uh, universal. Everywhere in the same, every ICU, you go to the intensive care unit, all the measuring, all the target is the same. So I think that is the most easy to get together and then we come out with uh, similar ideas. And then, especially in the critical care, I think that's a spend a lot of money. And uh, I think the, in the frames, you have more idea about the DRG and then I want. So therefore, I think that part can be useless. And a similar country, and, uh, Taiwan, you know, 23 million people, I think it's the right size. But compare, we are clustered together, just like in the, the industry, ICT industry. Even the, the, the health scale is also the cluster. So we can collect the data and then if we do something, it's more easy than the first. So if I have some uh, achievement or some product in the, in the first, we can have, uh, you know, through the come side to side. So the sign of the they are come to Taiwan and then we can collaborate. Yeah, so the Dr. Wu and the Dr. D, and then we can apply and, uh, you know the same box and to, to try and then about something. Yeah, that's the suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's a great suggestion. Um Mr. Tom, would you like to contribute? Probably not in answer to the last question, but in terms of Product development in Taiwan, we need to be cognizant of a few things that are uh, a little different in Taiwan compared to a lot of countries. Uh, for example, like um, Dr. Chen mentioned, uh, Taiwan is very close cluster. Acceptability of medical um, care is very, very easy in Taiwan, which is not the same in other countries. So in Taiwan, if you are accepting how to develop a particular product or software or hardware, 
and using Taiwan as a, the sole criteria for defining the product, we may be blindsided by the needs of other countries. Uh, the second thing is Taiwan, uh, the bright, less than bright students go for medical degrees. And so, but it's not the same in other countries. So in other countries, probably they go become lawyer, become financer, and not necessarily doctors. So in Taiwan, we typically run into a situation where we develop something and say, hey, I We go to see a specialist, a doctor, and we say, oh, there's no market here. For him, it's not a market. But outside Taiwan, it's a great market. So, so that's, those are a few things that we always remind ourselves. Uh, not to only look at the local situation, but also look at the potential market and find product from it. Thank you. Thank you for having us on this. High density um, the area. So, in a friend's company, you want to have a new idea or the new information of technology case. If you want to engage the Asia market, okay, I think Taiwan is a good place because Taiwan. Um, you can very easy to implement your the new innovation solution in here, and then we can give you a quick feedback, okay? Because uh, we are just a um, high density of industrial cross cross cost, right? So, so if you have a new idea, you have a POC, the concept you want to implement, the try, try the user behavior, try the user experience. I want is good, okay? You can co work with Taiwan's company, okay? And then uh, we just combine all the IT integration, all the IT capability, okay? Our data analysis, uh, machine learning, different So uh, we can give you a real the feel and the good, uh, the use scenario and the behavior, the feedback as quickly as sooner, okay? So, so I think maybe um, the last opportunity the Taiwanese company, we can cover with uh, our friends. If you want um, to engage the Asia people for anything about for the uh, smart health, the experience, we just uh, yep, can export Taiwanese company because uh, we have a very powerful capability here and can, can give you a quick feedback. Okay, and you can get to know, oh, what is the work? The quality doesn't work. You can you can put it. Okay, I think that, that is a very a very good point. Okay, thank you. So uh, <clears throat> I, when, when I saw these uh, slides, I was um, I was encouraged um, by the fact that I, I, I get a sense that the regula the regulator coming back to reimbursement, the payer, were working uh, very closely in France to ensure a runway of, of, of growing local industries. And, and, and DG Li and DG Wu, I'm not saying, I'm not saying this is not happening in Taiwan, right? I'm just saying I was encouraged by the fact that that was happening in, uh, in France. And, um, and, and I, I agree with DG Li, right? Um, government budget is one issue. And um, it's, it's our job as an enterprise to prove our solution can be cost effective. Right. And I'm confident we can do that in the next few years. But but again, coming back to the point was I, I saw how the payer and the regulator uh, in, in, in France in, in, in the Germany Diga were working together to, to, to grow this industry um, as a whole, uh, not just for international, but for patients and doctors. So I have another question. I guess uh, how can Taiwan and French people facilitate in uh, reimbursement, regulatory, and industry. Before this one, I have one question. When you ask one French people, such as my friend, or friend Stephen, what is it? It's the first impression of Taiwan. I think it's double A. Asus and Asus are the top. When you ask one hundred person, what is his impression of uh, French people? Well, it could be romantic, or some wine, or a cheese, maybe. So, of course, and we should be disagreeing with that one because we are far beyond 
all this vegetation. How these people is more rich in our diversity, will has been healthy with some of us and deep in the AI and machine learning. And we are very experimenting in some developing some of the medical devices so far. This is a way far from the stereotype and then then from up to this side. So I don't have a very, uh, I'm appreciate I have this chance to hear some of the very decent uh, uh, situation from all the experts. But what I propose to the question is very simple is that before further cooperation, I think the uh, understanding of other is very, very important. So it's, it's just a very short and, and very simple uh, recommendation that is good. So here's it's a very good chance that we open the window for each other. So have uh, more opportunity mingle or some of the conferences that on both sides that let us know each other. It's just that we know more about uh, about French people and that that is a university that is French people know more about what how many companies studies people can do. So when it's next time I asked Stephen they want to see the impression of Taiwan I think yeah he will say maybe 10 years later he will say yeah my family is just benefiting from technical application. Because the other product is just invented to benefit more people instead of an uh, entry level type of thing. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I, I just wanted to thank you and a short comment. You know, in, in generally, in the natural health issues, actually, there are many ways yeah, in the medical field. However, no one can get no debt. So what I want to say that uh, because I wish the growth budget can make use to all the providers and the patients. However, uh, since we start to use the, the we call the, the, the medical crowd, medical crowd, in that way we really avoid many duplication of intimidation or duplication of the drug medication. Yeah. So it is very useful for us to set more for that. Money and in that way, we wish all the new drug or new medical device can be applied to to our NGI to to I mean, to treat our people. So this is very important. Generally, everybody just want to run the business, but they don't know what happened for whole for budget. But uh, we already a big data. We know where is the money is going. Yeah. So I wish in the in the future we will be very very happy. Taiwan is a good place to do your business. Thank you very much for these great closing remarks. I was reminded that time's up. Um, we'll just um, give it one, one, uh, the chance to, to the audience to see if there was any questions. Um, maybe five more minutes, is that okay? Uh, because we have masks. So is there any question from the, the audience here today? Oh, okay, April. Uh, hi, my name is April. I have a, I have a question about, you know, for um for companies like Brian and Ad and Mr. Uh, Chan. Um, Dr. Uh, Wu was saying that the regulatory time they have a special consultation group and they try to walk you through to make sure you get the approval you deserve. And uh, Dr. Lee uh, was saying that you know if you're Divine or your therapeutics or whatever solution that you're providing good to be effective, then you will get the money. So for to be effective, what is the problem? What is the biggest challenge? Because there seems like everything is solved. You get your money, you get your approval. <laughs> What's the problem that's stopping us from being the leader in this field for the world? But I think uh, from from our own experience, the changes in TFDA uh, management of the industry uh, happens much more recent. So it's I think since the start of the pandemic, uh, with all the regulatory emergencies and innovation that are being introduced in many other countries, um, probably gave the inspiration to TFDA as well. So in our own experience, for example, four years ago, five years ago, when we were applying for a big data uh, solution to diabetes uh, dialysis treatment, um, our particular software is an AI that predicts intradiabetic hypotension, so the sudden drop of blood pressure. Uh, uh, and during that time, our, all these statistics are showing that it is effective. 
and it's of course safe because it's pure software. Uh, but unfortunately, we got stuck with the term AI. And finally, the recommendation of the reviewer to us is drop the AI. And so when we drop the AI, we got the certificate, the class two medical device. So that's our first software as a medical device certification. It's a class two device. Uh, our recent experience is very, very pleasant. And last year, when we were applying for TFDA and USFDA certification for our exoskeleton device, robotics. Uh, we submitted the final um, answer to the questions simultaneously to the TFDA and the USFDA. And very surprisingly, TFDA gave our certification two weeks after the USFDA. So it's, it's a very, very pleasant surprise because everyone was telling us it's an innovative product. You won't get the FDA. Wait until you get FDA. And so this time it's proven the other way around. So thank you very much. Anyone else would like to add something? Or let's see. You. Yeah, yeah, Carlos, so much. Um, I, you know, I think that I, I, I've been encouraged with what I saw today. Um, especially with the regulatory changes, uh, I think of Brian's thought. Um, we we're not we're not there yet with reimbursement, right? Uh, but I think the challenge is so far, uh, software as a medical device as a therapy, there hasn't been a, a solution yet that has gone all the way to reimbursement. I can't answer that, but uh, but with what I saw today, I'm, I'm quite encouraged. Um, so so long as we can demonstrate quality, efficacy, outcomes, and save costs. Right, for the CEO of insurance, I think uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, uh, again, so I'm so happy to be back here. Until now, I know that uh, Dr. Wu was so hard to on the innovation and also a revolution as to, to TMDA, so software submitted device. We just tried to reach uh, TMDA, I think, five uh, years ago. At that moment, I think it just uh, uh, Resolved this as a service and present there. So, there ought to be a lot of things for improvement. So, we spend a lot of time for the how they say, for the market. So, we apply a lot of uh, for FDA in the USA, and we got it uh, as we said, uh, this uh, chain out for the early July. So, now I know that we have more chance to apply for TFDA so far. So, we will do that in the action. We're working. <laughs> Okay, well, with that, um, we, I will be closing the panel discussion for today. And thank you so much for your patience and for your questions. And uh, I hope you learned something new. And uh, yeah, there will be perhaps more uh, coming in the future months. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very insightful discussion. Oh, and now we welcome Mrs. Leticia Lin, the co-president of the Atlantic Time for the closing report. So I promise I will not take long because you guys have been very well behaved for a few hours. <laughs> so I will not take uh, too long. So thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, I hope that you guys learned a lot. I did learn a lot myself. So I think uh, to make the story short, um, if there's one thing I will remember is uh, one word, which is collaboration. So I feel like uh, definitely there was a lot of positive energy. No matter you talk about you know, government officials, big corporates, small corporates. This is what I wish I did for a while started, to become a big corporate someday. So uh, I think that collaboration definitely would bring opportunities to everyone, so so I hope that uh, Lappenstein, we've been quite proud to be the first, you know, uh, to initiate actually the first of this kind of event between France and Taiwan, you know, about digital health. So I hope that we have put a little bit of seed to facilitate, I would say, or to kick off conversation, you know, between uh, the different stakeholders. So thank you so much, and uh, I definitely want to thank I mean, all the people who make this possible today. So the French office, uh, and uh, as well as the government officials, so Dr. Wu from FDA, uh, 
I think my papers that uh, Miss, Mrs. Lee uh, from ITV, uh, as well as um, Mr. Lee from uh, NIHA, uh, as well as uh, our experts from uh, Dr. Ray uh, J. Chen from Taipei Medical University, uh, Sanofi, of course, our partner you know, in Open Innovation, Anthony and, and the team, as well as you know, uh, companies present there, ASUS, uh, Windstorm, and uh, how's to think, and um, and uh, long, great app to react to, to, to encourage people, <laughs> send your people to exercise. Right? Okay, so I remember. So, uh, so thank you so much because you guys made an event very useful. And last but not least, I'd like to thank actually the super uh, volunteer team of La French Tech. So, again, they are all in place, they have real job. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amina and Asna, uh, for, for having been the moderator today. Uh, Heidi, Solis, uh, Alice as well, so to make that happen. And also our friends of uh, Chamber of Commerce, Stephanie, who help us with uh, the technical uh, continuity and all the setup. So thank you so much, and I uh, hope you to enjoy um, I mean, coffee, uh, drinks, and snacks. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. The most important is if you like that event, there's more to come <laughs> because actually Asna will work with the team to come up with a white paper. So I hope that you will you know, uh, take your time to read through that white paper. And uh, also maybe the last thing is uh, I'm apologize, I'm apologize for, the, for the French intervention. So we definitely have the replay of that session. So if somebody didn't hear it well, we'd we'll be happy to, to email you the replay of, um, of our French colleague session. Thank you so much. Thank you.